You're listening to Southern Fried Sports with Travis Ryer on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Uptown Square Media Station. WTUG HD2 Northport. And W265CG Tuscaloosa. Tide 100.9. And streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. This is Southern Fried Sports with Bama Online Senior Analyst Travis Ryer on your home for Alabama sports. Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. Alabama. Time once again for Southern Fried Sports right here on your home for University of Alabama Athletics. Tide 100.9 FM. Travis Schreier, Senior Analyst for BamaOnline.com with you on a daily basis from 11 a.m. until noon. The show, as always, brought to you by Peterbrook Chocolatier, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North. And I know a lot of folks associate the caramel hand-dipped chocolate Granny Smith apples at Peterbrook Chocolatier with more of the fall, say like Halloween, right? Think about candied apples, things like that. You think Halloween. Well, it's year round. It's year round at Peterbrook Chocolatier. I was by there yesterday and Zan, one of the outstanding chocolatiers there at Peterbrook, was working on these Granny Smith apples that she was coating in handmade caramel and then giving them a nice milk chocolate plunge before absolutely crusting them with pecans oh oh they look so good and you're gonna find them only at peterbrook chocolatier 1530 mcfarland boulevard north joined on the program by the executive producer of sfs jacob harrison and together we combine to form the 60 bit of of sports talk radio what about it jacob how you doing on this hump day morning I'm doing good. Running a few mock drafts, having some fun, chilling out. Oh, he's chomping at the bit. Chomping at the bit. We're just a few weeks away, right? Now, what, the night of April the 29th? They fire that baby up in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm going to tell you, I think Cleveland, Ohio gets a bad rap. I've been to Cleveland, Ohio. And look, I know they're bitter rivals, Jacob, of your Pittsburgh Steelers. And you're not going to give them an inch, probably, where it comes to respect. But I also know you're a big rock and roll guy. And I also have been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame there in Cleveland. And I'm just saying, if you ever, by accident, I guess, end up in Cleveland, Ohio, maybe you've been. you got to do the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Jacob. Just hold your nose. You know, wear sort of a, uh, you know, a scarf over your eyes. And then have them lead you into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame there in Cleveland. You'd love it. I'd be open to to definitely checking out the Rock and Roll <laughs> Hall of Fame. I'm not gonna lie, uh, Cleveland. You know, you know they get a they get at least one win every so often, and usually it's just that. <laughs> yeah, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You can't beat it. Hey, two zero five three four two nine nine zero four is the Peterbrook Chocolatier Studio Line. If you'd like to jump on board with Jacob and myself on this Wednesday morning, we'd love to hear from you. We got a lot to get into. We're gonna go around sports with an emphasis on college athletics i mean we sit right here in title town usa home of the alabama crimson tide which by the way as we told you yesterday on the program as it happened picked up another big piece to the men's basketball puzzle yesterday morning late yesterday morning charles bediaco the 611 post from img the canadian charles bediaco this has just kind of become montreal south down here you know Saskatchewan South, Vancouver South. That's Tuscaloosa, Alabama these days when you think about the Canadians. Love them. 
Absolutely love them. Charles Bediaco, and with that now, Alabama with a top three recruiting class, according to the 24-7 Sports Composite rankings for the 2021 cycle, Alabama men's hoops, where the Associated Press is concerned with a final ranking for the 2020-2021 season fifth in those AP rankings. And so you look at some of these way too early polls for next season, top 25s for the next college basketball season. You consider what we saw in January following Alabama's run to its 18th national title, a 13-0 and campaign. And in the aftermath, even with all the losses on offense, you go back to January and you see those next day, way too early top 25s. Alabama still won two in pretty much all of those. Alabama, Clemson, maybe some Ohio State in there, Georgia. And really, when you think about Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, quarterback changes at all three. That probably helped Alabama in the eyes of some folks that came out with those way too early polls back in uh, – Back in January. Oh, and that along with the fact that Nick Saban has now won six national championships in 14 years at Alabama. I guess they take that into account just a little bit, you think. But it also begs the question, when you consider this next year for Alabama football, Alabama men's hoop, which of the two do you think is more likely to fulfill expectations? As I just outlined for you, from a football perspective, it's just the expectation. The expectation is to be either the national champs or play for it. That's it in the Nick Saban era. That's what it's become for Alabama football. It was that way, of course, under Coach Paul Bryan as well. But there was a pretty good gap in between there from, what, 83 to 2007. So, but when you consider rosters and key aspects of both those teams and their relative sports, um, if the point guard position is the quarterback position, in basketball, you feel good about where Alabama basketball is going to be with that. You're not going to have Herb Jones on the ball, but you're going to have Javon Quinterly, it looks like. That's the expectation anyway. Josh Primo probably plays on the ball more. You got guys that can play that guard position, obviously, with Jaden Shackelford and others expected to return. You got J.D. Davison coming in, the five-star prospect, the headliner of this 2021 Recruiting class for Nate Oates. Football, again, offensively, you're looking at a revamp. And there has been some positive signs coming from that side of the ball, even from last Friday scrimmage with Bryce Young stepping in there at quarterback. Some new faces at the playmaker positions, both at wide receiver and running back. But I think you can make an argument that there are more questions for Alabama football to answer, personnel-wise, than there is even for Alabama men's hoops understanding Herb Jones some of the things Herb brought to the table weren't measurable statistically I get it intangibly you're going to miss a lot of that but you're also going to miss a lot of that for Alabama football you know it's not just the statistical production that you're losing on the offensive side of the ball all four as we talked about before unprecedented as best I can recall anyway unprecedented for one side of the ball to be home to four permanent team captains And that was the case with 2020 Alabama football. So it's a fun discussion to consider when you look at Alabama football and Alabama men's basketball. And it's also one that should bring a huge smile to the face of Crimson Tide fans everywhere. This is exactly what you want. Exactly what you want if you're an Alabama fan. 205-342-9904. That is the Peterbrook Chocolate Theory Studio. And hey, are the Braves going to win a game this season? Uh, Do we need to check in on the ATL? Another loss yesterday, this time up in D.C. Got the bats going a little bit, so that was good. Nice to see Ronald Acuna Jr. lead things off with a bomb. Freddie Freeman. The long ball was there, but just came up a little bit short. And so now you consider a doubleheader today that has just gotten underway up there at Nationals Park in D.C. Braves looking to still find their first win of the 2021 campaign. We'll have Cecil Hurt coming up in just a little bit. The very next segment, obviously a lot to get into with Cecil. A lot of ground to cover, man, since our last visit with Cecil. It's also a Masters Wednesday. It's here, man. The Masters is here. You had the Champions Dinner last night. Dustin Johnson 
hosting the past champions that were in attendance. Looked like a pretty good setup for DJ. I mean, you would kind of expect that, right? You know, DJ about 10 years ago, though, DJ 10 years ago, if he's having that champion's dinner, I think the Hooters that is just down the street from Augusta National Golf Club might have played a role in that champion's dinner. We're told now, though, that DJ is a soccer dad. You know, DJ's come a long way off the golf course. So uh, instead of uh, wings and things at Hooters, uh, DJ last night for his appetizers, he went with pigs in a blanket and lobster and corn fritters. I can get down with that. His first course was house salad or Caesar salad. Eh, you know, he had family style sides of mashed potatoes and spring vegetables. Pretty basic. And then for the main course, he had filet mignon and miso marinated sea bass. I like that surf and turf combo there, DJ. I like where your head's at with that. And then for the dessert, uh, peach cobbler and apple pie with vanilla ice cream. You can't go wrong with those. The peach cobbler, a nice hat tip, right, to the host state there, the state of Georgia. Got me to thinking if I were going to put together an all Tuscaloosa area champion's dinner, just from Tuscaloosa area establishments. You want to know what mine would look like or taste like? Well, for apps, I would go with Chuck's for a Krabby Travy Roll. Krabby Travy Roll is a special thing. You can ask Brandon and Corey upstairs there at Chuck's for the Krabby Travy Roll. Uh, they made that one for me special, and it's stuck with me now. It is soft-shell crab with cream cheese. You're going to have a little cucumber in that roll little crunchy, and then on top, you're going to have that crab salad all along the top of that roll, and I like that crab salad cold. I don't get it heated up. And then I'm also going to have Southern Ales Dixie Fries as an appetizer, sweet heat, and garlic Parmesan wings from Voodoo Wings. The first course, Heat's Garden Salad. I'm going to have some Raised on Country Bison and Elk Chili. Now, when you get the Elk Bison and Elk Chili, at Raised on Country, you want to get that smoked ghost habanero cheese on top. It'll fire you up a little bit. you got to be careful with that. But that's outstanding stuff. For sides, I'm going street corn from C Central Mesa. I'm going with the pimento mac and cheese from Southern Ale House. I'm going who's Q coleslaw and baked beans. You know, we've had this discussion on the program before, and it sounds like it's so easy to find good sides. It's really not, especially in barbecue. It frustrates me. Seafood, too. But who's Q's coleslaw? I don't know if they put a little bit of chopped jalapeno in there. It gives it a little something, but it's really good. Main course, I'm going with uh, pan chicken from Five, ribs, of course, from Archibald's, and then the bacon burger from Avenue Pub. The dessert will be that cheesecake by Tammy Smith. If you've never had that, that cheesecake by Tammy Smith, I think she has it down there at the uh, River, River Place Market downtown on weekends. Right there on the Black Warrior River. If not, Southern Ale House carries that cheesecake by Tammy Smith. It is the best cheesecake I've ever had anywhere. And I'm going to get that accompanied by dark chocolate dipped strawberries from Peter Brook. And then I've even got late night for the fellas, you know, because it gets a little late. And you're going to want that uh, Yardbird chicken sandwich from Southern Ale and the Thai chicken pizza from Heat. Maybe throw in some of the cheeseburgers from the Oasis out there in Cottondale. And uh, nightcaps from Sessions. Session right downtown there in Tuscaloosa. There you go. There's your all Tuscaloosa area champions dinner. If we were in charge here at Southern Fried Sports. Let's go to the Peterbrook Chocolatier Studio Line. Right now, I believe we have Lewis on hold for us. Lewis, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, Travis. Listen, I've got two more hours out here on the road, and my peanut butter crackers are wearing off, and you're, <laughs> you're killing me with this menu, buddy. Did you like the menu, though, Lewis? Did it hit the spot? Oh, man. Sweet stuff, man. It all sounds good. I like that. Hey, all Travis, right. I want to get your I want to get your opinion on something. Um, you know, we're kind of turning our attention. Of course, we've got the Masters and all, but we got spring football. People are starting to, you know, have a little football on the mind again. And, you know, name, in, image, and likeness, as you know, and you got to talk about on your shows uh, on the station. That's coming up. There's no way around it, it looks like. And and that, that can be a good thing for the student athletes. But uh, we also have the transfer portal, which is really heated up. You know, people 
aren't going to have to sit out a year, it looks like, and they can transfer around. Here's my question, Travis, and I'm going to hang up and listen. Will name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal hurt or help Alabama football? That's my question, Travis. I'd love to hear your input on that, and have a good rest of your day. Love the show. Hey, thank you, Lewis. It's, uh, there are two major questions for the future of collegiate athletics. I can't see how name, image, and likeness is going to hurt Alabama in terms of success on the field, on the court. I would think it would be another attractive aspect to the recruiting process if you're Alabama. Now, where I wonder is internally, if you're the University of Alabama Athletic Department, you're going to have to compete for sponsorship dollars now with the student athlete. Let's say money that used to come to you quite easily from, say, I don't know, Mercedes Benz. Is that money going to go to Bryce Young or the starting quarterback or someone like that? Is I would think, though, at Alabama, there's enough money to go around and you're already working off the huge television deals that you're a part of in the Southeastern conference. So I'm not going to cry poor. I'm not going to shed a tear probably for the university of Alabama or any of the sec member schools from that perspective. They're already doing extremely well. And when this new two 30 game deal goes into effect with ESPN taking over that from CBS, the cash is only going to uh, rain down even more. The transfer portal at this point hadn't hurt Alabama. You know, I mean, it's lost players to the transfer portal, but I don't know if they've been really a small percentage of guys that if we're being totally truthful, Alabama and Nick Saban had big plans for, you know, and they've cherry picked it as they've needed to, you know, they're short of tight end in their opinion. They go and they get a Carl Tucker from North Carolina last year and they need an extra wide receiver. They bring in a Garrick Dieter. Richard Mullaney, those type of guys. So uh, I don't see either being a problem. I think name, image, and likeness, it's just going to be a a great unknown until we actually see it go into play. It really is. You know, my hope as much as anything is that for the female student athletes, I saw something over the weekend in relation to the women's NCAA tournament and how someone like Paige Beckers, the freshman star for UConn women's basketball, she could end up benefiting more from name, image, and likeness than any athlete, male or female, at the college level. So there you go. Hey, I also saw where the AHSAA now is adding flag football as a sport starting this fall. I think that's great. I think it's outstanding. I think any opportunity for young people to have to participate in anything that is positive is a great thing. So the more the merrier. I think where it gets interesting with this is we actually have seen in our own house, as a matter of fact, and certainly where our Northridge Jags are concerned, we've seen females play football. Aline Charles right now is your starting kicker over at Northridge High School. Our daughter, Savannah, uh, a few years back, blazed some trails at Northridge and over in South Carolina in doing the same. So um, I, I don't know if it's necessarily going to discourage some young ladies from playing football, football, but I think this is great. I'll tell you this. If I'm the flag football coach, okay, I'm coming after, I'm coming after your soccer players and I'm coming after your track and field athletes with an emphasis on uh, probably track. I'm coming after your speed and stamina for that flag football team. So if you need a flag football coach, hit up the DMs, you know, I got plans. I got plans for recruiting, uh, inner, inner, uh, campus. Now I'm not going off campus. Not that you know of anyway, in recruiting, I'm talking about within the, within the enrollment, you know, who I would be targeting for my recruits there for flag football. Yeah. Those soccer kids, they can just run forever, man. They don't get tired. And then I want the uh, I want the track kids, you know, run those go routes. And then I'd probably 
probably head over to softball and get your catcher maybe. Maybe get the catcher to play quarterback. My quarterback, though, is probably going to be someone that even more so than the throwing ability, we're going to be lateral in a lot. You ever watch really you know, big-time flag football? Those cats, man, they're doing a lot of lateraling. You know, there's not a lot of dig routes and nine routes. It's not a lot like actual football. It's kind of like army ball if you ever played it growing up. Hey, we're going to step aside for our first break when we come back. Cecil Hurd of the Tuscaloosa News and Tidesports.com. He'll join us on a Wednesday edition of Southern Fried Sports presented by Peter Brook Chocolatier right after this. From the University of Alabama, this is Crimson Tide Today. It's a daily update on Bama sports, and it's brought to you by Kadeka Sausage, a true Southern flavor since 1947, and now the official smoked sausage of the Crimson Tide. Visit online at KadekaSausage.com. Hello again, everybody. I'm Roger Hoover. For the second time this season, Bailey Hemphill and Lexi Kilfoyle share the spotlight with a pair of weekly awards from the Southeastern Conference, earning this week's Softball, SEC Player of the Week, and Newcomer of the Week accolades, respectively. Hemphill reached base safely in 12 of her 13 at-bats over last weekend's Texas A&M series, hitting 5 for 6, along with 5 walks for a 9.23 on-base percentage. She earned at least one hit and one walk in each game of the series, and drove in at least two runs in each game, totaling seven runs batted in. Kilfoyle was a dual threat against the Aggies, appearing in the circle and at the plate in all three games. Next up for the Tide softball team is a weekend trip to Arkansas for a three-game series with the Razorbacks. I'll have more in a moment. The Crimson Tide's newest partner is already an Alabama favorite. Kaneka Sausage is now the official smoked sausage of the Crimson Tide. Made in Evergreen, Alabama, Kaneka's tradition of making the finest hickory smoked sausage hasn't changed in over 70 years. Always great for breakfast, Kaneka Sausage is now a tailgate grilling favorite. Kaneka Sausage, a true Southern flavor since 1947, and now the official smoked sausage of the Crimson Tide. We've got you covered for Alabama baseball today against ULM at Sewell Thomas Stadium. Tuesday's game was canceled, but all single game tickets for Tuesday's game will be honored for this Wednesday matchup. First pitch is scheduled for 3 p.m. with radio coverage on the network starting at 2.55 p.m. Central. And that's your BAMA update. Crimson Tide Today brought to you by Kaneka Sausage. Crimson Tide Today is a production of the Crimson Tide Sports. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky partially sunny, the high at 80. For tonight, becoming cloudy, showers and strong storms arrive, mainly after midnight, the low at 62. Tomorrow, thunderstorms ending during the morning, some clearing by afternoon. Afternoon, the high 78. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 75 degrees in Tuscaloosa. Tide 100.9. For more coverage of Alabama football, visit us at Tide100.9.com or download the free Tide 100.9 app. The Crimson Tide will not be denied. Back with more of a Wednesday edition of Southern Pride Sports right here on Tide 100.9 FM. Travis Ryer, Senior Analyst for BamaOnline.com with you each and every weekday morning from 11 a.m. until noon. Augusta, Georgia, your playlist theme of the day. Augusta, Georgia, very own James Brown. James Brown Arena there in Augusta, Georgia. Guy who has spent some time in Augusta, Georgia, I'm guessing, or at least passing through Augusta, Georgia in the past, is, of course, Cecil Hurd of the Tuscaloosa News and Tidesports.com. Masters Wednesday, Cecil. How are we doing? Good. Spent a little time in Augusta. A little time in Augusta? Yeah. My grandparents were from, my dad's parents were from, Lincolnton, which is about 40 miles away, so this is a big week. You know, a lot of people rented houses, even in Lincolnton, during Masters Week. So, um, Been there a few times. Yeah, been there a few times. I guess maybe going to Columbia, South Carolina. 
you could go through there, go yeah, through Augusta, sure. Georgia. Sure. Uh, sure. And we'll see. Which so, last last time we saw JT, uh, it was a good thing, I guess. Uh, the uh, yeah, the people players. who've never yeah people who've never been would be surprised at the setting around Augusta, Augusta National. You know, it's kind of right in town. You come out the front gate. There's a, you know, a it's like McFarland right outside car, the front gate. Uh, you know, car title pawn and so forth. <laughs> so, uh, uh, little di- Hooters, a little uh, different John on Daly. the other side of the gate. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not North River on Lake Tuscaloosa, like I guess is what we could say. You know, outside the the gates there at Augusta National. Uh, but Cecil, certainly so much has happened since we last talked and much of it not uh, what we like to talk about typically. But uh, I know, as you wrote about, uh, so so great, uh, the, the column especially that, that you did and you. eulogizing basically uh, Luke Ratliff over the weekend, affectionately known as Fluff, of course, Fluffopotamus88 on Twitter. Um, just... Uh, yeah, we we talked about it throughout the week, and again, I know for you personally, it it struck a a, a really deep chord there. Um, it did, it did. I'd seen uh, Luke in Indianapolis, and and um, the the one thing I'd like to say, and I'm not I'm not going to get uh, sentiment, sentimental or repeat um, a lot of uh, a lot of the things that I said. Um, in the column, uh, but I don't want people to have the impression that all Luke did was run around and go to games and, and whoop. And, you know, Luke was 23. Luke was a college student, uh, but he was also cautious. You know, he, he, we went out to dinner on my birthday, uh, Luke and Hunter Johnson and I, and Luke was masked up and we observed the, the, all the pro every protocol that everybody in Indianapolis was, we had, a, you know, they, they didn't have tables together and so forth. And, and, you know, so Luke was not, would never have knowingly put anybody at risk. So where, where he developed what the, what the final determination is going to be, um, we'll see. It's just a tragedy whatever the cause of death was, mm-hmm. and including whether it was COVID related, which the doctors did tell um, his family. But, um, you know, Luke was, Luke was very cautious and, and was not just, you know, wild college student spring break kind of guy. So, um, I, I, and I just don't want to be a breakdown into, a, Oh, you know, Alabama student took it to, Indiana or Alabama student caught it in Indiana. Um, it's just sad that Luke's gone. You know, what, whatever the reason, it's just sad. I encourage everybody to 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 wear masks and be cautious. And, and but this isn't this this isn't a teaching moment from that point. It's a personal moment. So I just wanted yeah, to say that. Yeah, we're not talking about reckless behavior here. I mean, Luke was obviously still living his life like the rest of us have done uh, more and more it seems like as the last year is is moved along but uh yeah that's that's tough that the loss is enough right i mean the loss of a 23 year old uh living life uh to its fullest should be enough uh that we don't have to uh you know drag in some some other angles um you know and 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 sort of cheapen his the, the loss and the 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 impact that he had and so many positive ways. That's the word that I keep hearing. I wasn't, I wasn't close to Luke like you were, uh, but positivity, uh, positive. That's the the adjective that it seems like is on a loop when it comes to describing Luke. He he was, and he was he was very intelligent. He was very thoughtful, and and um, just wanted to just wanted to say that, and and the outpouring of support from him from. Around Alabama and around the SEC, I know his family is, is very grateful. I know Luke would be excited, right, uh, with with the continuing arc uh, and, and tracking that this this men's basketball program is 
seeing taking seeing take place here in the last few days uh you know with the the expectations already being put right out there as far as way too early top 25s for next season and then the commitment of a 611 post who should fit a need for this Alabama program moving forward quite nicely I guess Cecil um it should it it, it should and uh, you know we'll see it's just so early you know people doing um, different projections and so forth. So, so we'll see um, how it it all shakes out roster wise at the end. But I, I think it was obvious in the UCLA game that that Alabama needed a, a shot blocking presence, you know, an inside presence defensively, which I think is going to really be. Uh, I, I don't think, despite the the. Um, perception that people have a Nate Oates offense that you're going to see Betty Ako shooting a bunch of threes. I don't think that's what his aim is. Now, he may be able to do that, but if, if Chico's healthy and, and Betty Ako is, is uh, able to work in, um, you know, they'll be much bigger around the rim, much more uh, able to, to block shots. And that's not taking nothing away from the inside guys, Bruner, Alex Reese, Rojas, Juwan Gary, uh, who really did a good job. But sometimes they get overmatched. You know, six nine kids, um, 16 kid in the post would give them some trouble. So um, it, it will be interesting to see um, how they – change if they change it all you know nate's not going to change what he does off as far as offensive philosophy but uh it would be a, it'll be a little different to have two six eleven um available to them but that's not something that they had on this year's team the transfer portal uh and how volatile it can be i guess it's just to the point of even if you're in a situation like nate oates where from the outside, it looks like, wow, look at this core coming back, this roster coming back. Uh, and you consider J.D. Davison already being on board, a four-player four class right now. Um, when you talk about J.C. and high school players, it looks outstanding. Uh, you almost don't have a choice, I guess, at this point, though, but to be an active participant in the portal. And that involves whether you've got players going in or maybe you're looking to cherry pick a little bit. Um, we've seen Alabama cherry pick the portal in football. Do you think Nate's kind of more in that mode when it comes to the portal now with what he's got assembled? I, I don't, I, I think he likes the roster that he has and mm-hmm. Betty Ako, I, I've seen some speculation about the seniors could take that sixth year COVID. I, I don't think that John or, or Herb or Jordan Bruner are interested in that. I really Alex might be, but I don't think that that's going to happen. If Alex wanted to come back, they'd probably uh, work with him. Um, but I, I don't think that that's likely. Um, without having spoken to Alex, I don't want to speak for him. Uh, you know, I think John, you know, John, I think tweeted a farewell tweet the other day. I think her is clearly ready for the pros and, and, you know, Jordan's already transferred. He's got his degree, and, and I think he wants to, to get on, whether it's basketball or, or you know, what it would be. Uh, but I think I think even with that said, um, Nate likes the roster that he has, so they're not going to go overboard on transfers. But if you think you can improve yourself, you know, that's your job as, as the coach. So they'll take a hard look. You know, there's no question. There have been... They've been linked to a couple of guys, Namari Burnett, um, who was a McDonald's All-American that they recruited really heavily out of high school. He signed with Texas Tech. Of course, uh, he, he had entered the portal before Chris Beard left Texas Tech. Um, super athletic guy. Didn't shoot it real well his freshman year that, and in limited playing time at Texas Tech. But that's something that you could work on but, but would give him uh, uh, another one of those big 
bodies on the perimeter that they liked. You know, they have to replace John and her. Um, Noah Gurley from Furman, who's a forward who can really shoot it. Uh, he's mentioned Alabama, whether it, that's what he wants to do out of the portal or not. Um, so it will uh, be interesting to see, but I don't think that they're just going to. You know, this isn't a first year transition, you know, in a, in a first right. year and, and after the first year. And, and it was really good to see Galen Smith in Indianapolis, and, and he had a nice year for Maryland. Worked out well for him, but uh, wasn't a guy that really fit the Alabama system. He fit Maryland system. Uh, Javion Davis was the same. Um, so it, I, I think they, they, you know, have a certain sense that, that the guys they've brought in, they're going to, they're going to work with. Now, you know, if you honestly sit down with a guy and honestly tell him he might get more playing time somewhere else, then he might want to do that. But it's not a, it's not a first year transition like it was last year. Cecil, let's talk some football. Um, Alabama with its first scrimmage last Friday. I know you've been sort of break some news real quick. All right. Coaching transfer portal, Sean Miller out at Arizona. Oh, wow. That's a tough off season for the Miller bros, right? Yeah. Um, Sean and Archie now. Sean and Archie, they can, they can buy, uh, <laughs> they can afford a really nice RV. And just kind of cool. Wow. Uh, so you're talking about whether that's Indiana and Arizona just between the. Sean, whether that's something that's reflective of, of Sean's NCAA, Arizona's mm-hmm. NCAA situation, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Meanwhile, but, Wayne, but it's it's wanted to mention that, Rouge, that like Tony but, Montana. You know, you know? And no, I do not think Nate will be a candidate at Arizona. I don't think that's hmm. um, the direction he's going to go. But yeah, um, on to football a little bit. What what little I've been able to keep up with football. Sounds almost retro in some way, Cecil, that maybe the defense is ahead of the offense somewhere in the in would, college football. I would, I would have thought that, you know, if I knew nothing about Alabama, except what they had lost on offense, which includes starting quarterback. Um, In the first scrimmage, I would have said, yeah, the defense will probably be ahead. Now, this time last year, when they had all those weapons offensively and were sort of rebuilding, I think, a little bit defensively, it was a little bit different. But, yeah, you look now, the, the names that people talk about as being First round, you know, last year it was all the offensive first rounders, and this year it's it's uh, and the defense had certainly Sertan will be a first rounder. Christian Barmore could be going to depend on where he, you know, what team likes him and what team has a need for that. Uh, but this year, you know, you, you just hear people rave about Christian Harris and Will Anderson and and some of those guys on defense. Um, against a a new transitional offensive line, new quarterback, uh, new receivers, really even the, the, probably the projected a receiver for the fall, John Mechie's not going through the spring. So, um, yeah, I'm not surprised that the defense would be ahead at all. What do we think in terms of, offensive realistic expectations given this run over the last three or four years with a new quarterback in there revamped offensive line revamped uh wide receiver core for the most part um bring back Jalil Billingsley at tight end that's a bright spot but you know how far back do you think we need to to consider uh when looking at everything Alabama has to replace on offense and you know, where this group, you know, its ceiling might be, understanding we're just one spring scrimmage into this. I mean, do we need to maybe think about 2014-like with Lane coming in and, you know, Blake having that year and Mari Cooper at wide receiver, the two-headed running back situation with T.J. Yeldon and Henry. I mean, you still had some personnel. Um, I don't know. Maybe this group has more to prove offensively than 
than even five, six years ago. Um, they do, and a new offensive coordinator, Bill O'Brien. So, mm-hmm. you know, that'll factor into it. <laughs> I, I, I honestly think uh, that that deep down, although although it's been well, it's been well uh, documented that, that uh, Nick Saban has adapted to the new style and outscoring people and you got to score more points and so forth. I don't think it hurts his heart to line up and run the football. You know, I think that's still, <laughs> you know, part of his DNA and they certainly should have the ability to, to do that. You know, whether one of the back um, is going to become a, another Najee Harris, another, you know, there won't be another Derrick Henry, genetically but um you know a, a home run hitting back brian robinson certainly has uh capability to, to carry a good part of the load but i would think you might see a little bit more of the the rotation situation that that you talked about so um again we'll just have to say they've, they've got a lot of guys to get the to get the football to um you know that that uh saw a glimpse of Jace McClellan last year. I think everybody liked what they saw. Roy Dale William, Keelan Robinson's back and, and had seen a glimpse of him and, and know what he can do. I've got the number one running back, depending on your recruiting service, um, in the country coming in. So, um, you know, you, you've got to find some way to, to utilize those guys. If you're going to have talent or else <laughs> Else you end up, and I thought Alvin's interview about uh, coming in as a freshman at Alabama, if anybody saw Alvin Kamara. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, good. About being 17 years old, <laughs> and you went to the room, and there's they got Derek Henry and Kenyon Drake and um, Yeldon, you know, Jostin Fowler. Um, eyes eyes open, you know, for, uh, for all the. Um, Rest in peace, Alti and um, Alvin. And think how good Alvin is. I mean, you know, it wasn't any case of they misevaluated Alvin. Worked out great for Alvin. I'm happy for Alvin. But um, you know, it's it's uh, going to be crowded. So so you got to take advantage of that. Make that a positive. Yeah, and, I thought that interview with Alvin was sort of a Paul Harvey moment. Now you know. The rest. Now you saw the rest. <laughs> I thought Alvin was great. He, he oh has yeah, matured great. so much. He has matured yeah. so much from when he got here, and deserves all the success he had, has had, and will continue to have. Plus, I'm a Saints fan, so exactly so, that's what matters. Hey, uh, we talked about the portal in relation to college basketball, but. You know, this one-time transfer rule, I guess we're anticipating this perhaps to go down at, uh, in the next week or so, maybe Cecil. And then, you know, how does the SEC follow suit? I guess when you look at all these guys and gals in the transfer portal where basketball is concerned and uh, even football, you know, perhaps with a potential particular linebacker from the University of Tennessee being involved, uh What's your anticipation of all this here in the next week or so with the one-time deal? I think the momentum is that it'll pass. Uh, what the SEC will do, um, I don't know. I, I think between just the general trend of public opinion and, and the COVID year, uh, people aren't interested in making kids sit out for a year. Um, so, so. Uh, I think in general, I mean, what, what particularly, you mentioned Henry Toto from Tennessee. They've had a coaching change there. Why are you going to force him to sit out a year? You know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that goes both ways. And it's different. You know, five years ago with Maurice Smith, it was much different. People's attitudes were different. But now, I, I don't know. But, I mean, Coaches don't like it. You know, Nick Saban wouldn't like to, to have uh, one of those running backs we were talking about transfer to 
Auburn or Florida and have to face them next season. But, um, you know, I, I, I think the general opinion is that, that um, the one-year exceptions in the past, and, and um, I don't know that people are as emotional about that as they once were. I saw where Scott Strickland, the AD at Florida, was interviewed, I guess, last week, and he was asked about the SEC rule, and he, he was pretty pretty adamant about his his approval would be there to do away with the the SEC rule on interconference uh, transfers. So, yeah. Yeah, be... you know, <laughs> um, I hadn't seen a statement from Greg Byrne about that specific issue, but um, – and he's certainly going to consult with Nick Saban before he um, makes a decision on that. I mean, you know, obviously it's not just football, but I think that's the 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 one that most people pay attention to. Um, but but again, I think the momentum is headed in that direction. Well, Cecil, as always, we appreciate the time, my man. I know it's been a crazy and sort of roller coaster, not only basketball season, but certainly this last week and. Uh, we appreciate you joining us here on the show, as always. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, congratulations to Baylor. We didn't even get a chance to talk I about know. What a performance, how man. Dominant they were. I'll tell you one thing about Baylor, too, and I'm not. I'm, I'm repeating what many, many people have said. Um, I don't know who the strength and conditioning guy for Baylor basketball is. <laughs> but he needs a cut of that bonus money. Those are grown people. Those were grown Ooh. people out there on Monday no, night, weren't they? Gonzaga was, I mean, <laughs> has great players. And, you know, Suggs is built like a football guy, but mm-hmm. Taylor had the 23-year-old guys that clearly had been you know, doing some, some lifting. And, you know, if you can out-quick them and out-skill them, that's fine, but they also, you know, they were so athletic on the perimeter, and then they could just keep rolling those big guys in there. And when I say big guys, I mean big, strong guys. Yeah, henchmen almost, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so I don't, I don't know if that's the, you know, I don't know if, if college basketball is going the the Bryson DeChambeau route, but um, <laughs> you know, they, they they looked good. You know, they were, and you know, they weren't. Muscle bound, you know, no. man. They were just no. they were like strong, guys. powerful yeah. dudes. Yeah. So, so and, and play great. And congratulations. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All, All right. right. Cecil, look thing. forward to doing it next uh, week. Take okay. Care. Thanks, Travis. There he goes. Uh-huh. Cecil Hurt. Okay. Outstanding, as always, from the Tuscaloosa News and Tidesports.com. Yeah, that Baylor Gonzaga game, it was like the difference between what you would see at 8 a.m on a Saturday morning, maybe at the Phelps Center, you know, the kids, the rec league kids playing. And then if you go over to the Y League a little bit later in the afternoon, a little, little bit different, just a little bit different between those two teams on Monday night. Going to step aside for a final break. We come back. We'll put a wrap on a Wednesday edition of Southern Fried Sports right here on Tide 100.9 FM right after this. Diabetes, high blood level. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky partially sunny, the high at 80. For tonight, becoming cloudy, showers and strong storms arrive, mainly after midnight, the low at 62. Tomorrow, thunderstorms ending during the morning, some clearing by afternoon, the high 78. I'm James Spann of the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 76 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The flagship station for Alabama Crimson Tide football. Alabama touchdown. Only on Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. Pitching optional, apparently, up in D.C. today. Braves and Nationals tied at four in the top of the second. Braves with runners on first and third and two outs. 
trying to uh, take the lead here in the top of the second. Nationals got to Max Reed for four. In the bottom of the first, the Braves with a single in the top of the first. So, uh, getting it after it at the plate already up there in D.C. in game one of a doubleheader today between the Braves and the Nationals. I want to thank Cecil Hurt for joining us, as he always does on Wednesdays. I always enjoy having Cecil with us. And when we talk to you tomorrow, the Masters will be underway. Pretty cool tomorrow morning. Lee Elder, first African-American to participate in the Masters tournament. He will join Jack Nicholas and Gary Player for the ceremonial first tee shot to get things going tomorrow morning. Cool, cool moment. No doubt about that. Weather going to be a little iffy for over there in Augusta on Friday and Saturday. I guess some of that rough weather we're expected to get tonight is eventually going to find its way over into East Georgia. But uh, they always figure out a way. They always figure out a way to get all 72 holes in over there at Augusta National. Yes, we're going to get up out of here, James. It's time to go. Time to go on a Wednesday. And the lunch whistle on this Wednesday, Southern Ale House. 1530 McFarland Boulevard North in the Indian Hill section of Tuscaloosa. We had a couple of entrants on our own Tuscaloosa area Masters Champions Dinner menu. That's right. Of course we did. A couple of three. We had that yard bird chicken sandwich, which is always out of this world. That pimento mac and cheese, one of those handmade sides you can get there at Southern Ale House as well. Great, great stuff. The Dixie Fries, we told you about, too. Great, great stuff there at Southern Ale House, 1530 McFarland Boulevard North. Thanks to Jacob Harrison for producing it, as always. And until 11 a.m. on Thursday, have a great rest of your Wednesday, everybody.